I don't know how in the world I killed all this time and didn't get mic'd up. And now I have to hold this mic and I like to use my hands to talk. That's tough. But nonetheless, uh, God bless you. We're glad to see you here tonight. I'm glad to see uh, my buddy Frank back tonight. Had a good breakfast and a good, good working breakfast this morning. Learned some great things about this great man of God and his family. Excited about what God's got for his future and, uh, and for the future of the church. Amen. Amen. And uh, God is just doing some great and awesome things. And um, I, I am very excited uh, to give you the update that I know, which is not much. I called our banker just before church. He says, I got an email from the people that I need to get an email from, which is appraisers. And um, they're expecting a, a few more days. So what's new, right? And uh, that sort of ties my hands, but uh, I, I wanted to keep you in the loop. But um, I assure you, I have talked with Brother Garner since he, he's already moved to Cleveland. But I don't know if you know it or not, but Brother Garner, the former state overseer, his job is to come and help pastors that are in building projects to get their financing with the bank and get all that straightened out because he's a builder himself and he's very, very well versed in the terminology and the lingo and all of that has to go on. So he called me the other day and said, have you heard from the bank yet? I said, no, I haven't yet. And he said, well, you be sure you call me first. And um, so I assure you, we will have the deal, the deal worked out uh, shortly. And uh, one way or the other, we're going to build a church. Amen. And we're not going to, but the Lord is going to do it. He's going to use people like you and people like me. And you're going to learn tonight, if you stay with me long enough, we're going to talk about launching out into the deep. To the deep. You're going to find out that God's going to use people like you and people like me. Amen? So um, we're delighted to see you tonight. God bless you. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you kids are glad to be back in school? Come on now. <laughs> how many of you parents glad the kids are back in school? <laughs> Amen. God bless you as you go to your classes. Uh, um, so uh, we're looking so much forward to what God has in store for the church and the kids this year. Amen. Uh, Sister Becky told me they had 12 new kids in Children's Church Sunday. Can we give the Lord praise for that? Twelve new kids in children's church. How many of you know what Friday is? I know you're going to say it's the day before Saturday and the day after Thursday, right? It's the thugs. That is the teens humbly upholding godly standards. I remember I was at the funeral home with Sister Darlene helping make arrangements for Brother Tom who had passed. And um, we said one of the love, loves of his life was the thugs. He looked up at me. And he said, uh, could you say that again? I said, the thugs. Oh, I said, oh, I'm sorry. It's the youth group of the church. And uh, he said, surely there's a meaning behind that. And so I had to, you know, teens humbly upholding godly standards. But he sort of chuckled and looked. And, but anyway, uh, we always, every year, have an awesome time with the thugs youth revival. Um, so we're looking forward to it. I believe Brother Daniel Shanahan, isn't he preaching the first night? Brother Daniel is a young man that God has his hand on. There's no doubt. Two years ago he preached and we squeezed. Now he's one of our own. He is a thug. One of our own. <clears throat> I think he was a junior or senior in high school at that time. He preached that night and we packed, I don't know how we did it, but we packed 329 people in this building. We had all the kids about 12 and under just you know, stacked up like cordwood around the altars here. And we had them piled out there standing, and we had them in the foyer. And so um, right now we've, we've done the, um, or the teams have done the outreach. Brother Daniel will be here Friday night. The kickoff pre-service starts at 6.30. Uh, we're looking forward to what God's going to do. Um, without a doubt, he's going to do some great things. On Saturday night, Brother Jack Smock, uh, is going to bring the word on Sunday morning, Sister Tara. If you've never, how many of you ever heard Tara teach? Tara can preach. That means to to teach and preach at the same time, right? And she can do an awesome job, ladies. I'm going to tell you, those who signed up for the verbs of God, 
I know it's a small group and there's going to be some interaction in there, but she's going to uh, blow your mind with some of the teaching that, that she's going to bring to the table. So I'm, I'm convinced you're going to be in, in for a, a great treat there. She's going to preach Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday night, our own youth pastor, Brother Josh Cribs, is going to be breaking the bread. And we're just going to have a great time. I've had the, the luxury of watching Josh since he was in second grade. And, uh, you know, when I came here 17 years ago, I've seen the Lord move upon him. Uh, I've watched him shoot more basketballs than I care to count. Uh, you know, when he was growing up, I thought I could claim him on my taxes, and William and Tanya thought they could claim Adam on theirs. And so we tried it one year. No, we didn't. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we probably could have as much as they stayed at each other's house. But um, God has really blessed us, and we raised them up on the farm team. God's raised up great men like Todd. Uh, Carter as well as Adam and Josh and different ones, Daniel, and I could go on, Jack, and uh, God's doing some great things. I'm very excited about the youth revival, and I want to say without any equivocation that God is going to move among our teenagers. Amen? Now, let me say this. I, I mentioned this in our kids' revival. We had the, the incredible kids' revival, and you know, you and I, we're prone sometimes to think it's all about us coming Come and satisfy me. Come and feed me with the Word. I want to say this. We, we have, you know, 50 other weeks out of the year that we come and we are fed food. I mean, just like if you missed it Sunday, you just missed it. We had an awesome time in the Word of God. But that one week we set aside to give the kids the incredible kids revival. And, you know, God help us if we lose our children. For what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? I'm going to tell you, losing my children would be about like losing my soul. Are you with me? So, and then, now we have the teenagers. And you know what? I thank God that I'm in a church that loves the kids and loves the teenagers. I'm telling you because, you know what? You and I have lived most of our life probably, or at least I'm speaking from this side, and 45, I guess that's half of 90. Maybe I've lived half my life, you know. I maybe live three quarters of it. I don't know. But I know this. I want to leave something behind. And the only way you can leave something behind is, is if you put something in some of the younger ones. And I'm full well willing to sacrifice a service or two or a week or whatever or money, whatever it is, to make sure my children and, and grandchildren and teenagers have what I was given, uh, you know, and more so if I can. Are you with me? Say Amen. Now, I want to talk with you from Luke chapter number 5. I want to read verses 1 through 11. You have it? Say amen. I do want to remind you about the, the turn back to uh, two services. And I know you say, well, that's, that's kind of crazy. And this past Sunday, we had a very good crowd. Um, in fact, I'm going to tell you, church of God people will scare you to death. You know what? I mean, they really will. You know, at start time, I'm not talking about 5 till. I'm not talking about 10 till. I'm talking about at start time. When the buzzer has already hit zero, zero, there's 50 people in the building. Huh? At 20 after, you know, there's nearly 200 in the building. Um, now, better late than never, and I applaud you for getting here. Don't do the rapture like you've been doing church, though. I felt that one all the way over my toes now. <laughs> Because, hey, if you get to the rapture a little late, you're going to look up and see the hoofs of the horse I'm on, right? He, he, we're gone. Man, I'm having a good time with it. Uh, so we're going to return to two services. Uh, now, I, I'm going to personally approach some of you, and if you want to volunteer and come see me or one of the pastors, you're welcome to do it myself, Brother Adam, Brother Josh, Brother Aaron, Brother Ken. We need some, I know everybody likes that 930 service. Man, get in there and get it, and you got a long break to the night service and whatever. Uh, uh, but I'm going to need a handful, uh, five or ten families or so that will commit, say, Pastor, I'll come to the 11 o'clock. Because we have a lot of visitors come to the 11 o'clock service. We do. I mean, people never knock the door of church. All of a sudden they show up at 11 o'clock, and it, where's all of our folks? Well, they come to the 930 service so they can be on the golf course by, Right? Or wherever they got to be. It might be at the drop zone or whatever. But anyway, I, I, um, I, I just want you to think about possibly coming to the 11 o'clock service um, and uh, help us do ministry. 
and not just come to church, but be the church. Are you with me? Amen. God bless you. Uh, launching out into the deep, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered to him and said, Master, we've toiled all night and we've caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Man, I could preach right there or teach right there or preach right there. Lord, we're tired. Lord, we've worked all night. Lord, we know what we're doing. We're fishermen. We, we've been on this lake. We've been raised here. We've done all that we know to do. And we, the, we're the best in our business, really. I know some of y'all talk to the Lord like that, right? We're the best at what we do, and we hadn't caught a thing. And the, but, but, but Simon Peter said, But nevertheless, Lord, just because you said so, I will let down the net one more time. Y'all with me? I will invite one more person out to lunch. I will go to one more service. I will preach one more sermon. I will... Y'all follow me, right? Okay. I'm just making sure. He said, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. See, sometimes it's only one time. Sometimes it's only one more attempt before you catch that big one. He said, and they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking, so they signaled to the partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. O oh Lord, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And they were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Now, ladies, that wasn't just for you, right? <laughs> Some of y'all will catch that when you go home. He says, Simon Peter, From now on, you shall catch men. Not just fish, but you shall catch men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. I could ask the question, what have you forsaken for the call? Boy, that'd be a good one. Man, I've got to remember that. Uh, okay. Um, I suppose if we had one desire in common, it would be that God would use us for his glory. If you're a Christian, at least that should be in common with one another. Sometimes that seems to be so out of reach. We feel as though we're not qualified, we're not up to the task, or we don't have enough Bible knowledge or enough ingenuity. We don't have enough information. We don't have enough uh, connections, etc., etc., etc. So then I must ask you, what kind of people do you think it is that God uses? If there was ever a person who was surprised that God uh, not only called him into his service, but indeed did use him in such a powerful way, it would be the man that we're talking about right now, and his name was Simon. Uh, he was that first century fisherman there at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Peter was introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew. When Jesus met him, he changed his name from Simon Peter in 1 John uh, 1 and 40, you'll see it there. One of the two of them heard him speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon. He said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at him, he said to him, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. That's why you hear in another place, Simon bar Jonah. That means Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated stone. So first time he met Jesus, Jesus changed his name. From, from uh, Simon Peter, or from Simon to stone, from reed to rock. If We'll get there in just a moment. Are you with me? So he's introduced, but why the name change? Simon literally means reed. Um, he was a man, you know what a reed that grows by the river? I'm not, you, you see. Uh, he was blown by every wind, if you will, so to speak, and he was very aware of that. 
uh, the winds of public opinion and his beliefs perhaps had often been shaken. I don't even know that he professed to believe in anything. But Jesus saw him and he called him Peter, Simon Peter. He took him from being a reed and said, I'm going to make you a rock. Instead of being blown here and there and tossed to and fro, I'm going to make you solid, something upon which someone can build. Amen. So, um, so Jesus saw more in him than what he saw in himself. And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus sees more in you than what you see in yourself. His journey with Jesus was one of being transformed from this reed to the rock. And his journey began one day with an encounter with Jesus by the Sea of Galilee. Peter had grown up there and he lived in the town of Capernaum. Uh, it's at the northern tip of the sea. The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and 8 miles wide, 680 feet below sea level. So uh, almost like a soup bowl at times. And it is very prone to this tropical environment. But in Jesus' day, the place had um, somewhat metropolized for, for the area that it was. About 15,000 people, scholars say, lived in that area of Capernaum and Galilee. So Peter's fishing business, or he's in the fishing business with his brother Andrew. They're partners, and then there's close friends named James and John. And that's the way churches grow, by the way. You get the one closest to you, and then you get your friends, and you get their friends. Isn't that right? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, so one, day the que one day in the question, these fishermen had just spent a tough night fishing, they've done all they know to do and they couldn't get anything, everything failed, they're tired, they're frustrated, they're at the shoreline and there's the crowd that's gathered around and then there's this new controversial teacher named Jesus that some were saying was the Messiah. The, uh, he's preaching this word of God and Simon listened to him from a distance, if you will. Jesus had started preaching in the synagogues. Now, the synagogues were built in every Jewish town, in every Jewish city. The Jews would gather on the Sabbath day to worship, to pray, to read the Bible, uh, or to read, rather, the exposition of Scripture, the scrolls as they had it, and for fellowship, things that we still do today, or we should. <clears throat> One of Jesus' first sermons was delivered in the nearby town of Nazareth where he had grown up, according to Luke 4, or Luke 4 and 16. We find him here, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as custom was, he went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I wonder how many of us in this room now, want to launch out and do more than just come to church, but would really like to grab hold and be the church. Any takers? Huh? I, I don't know about you, but, and, and I'm doing it. I mean, I'm living it myself. I, you know, I, I told Brother Frank this morning as I was, uh, we were eating, I said, you know, when the Lord called me, I was not one to set aside and just wait for something to happen. I made my mind up that God called me, and if God called me, there was a place of ministry. And I had older men tell me. I had some, some, some men that were in the church of God that, that felt like they were overlooked by the church, and they said to me um, disheartening things like, well, I hope they don't do you like they've done me. You know, I... Uh, I hope you get a real shot. I did get a real shot, all right? Twice. Are you with me? Both churches on the verge of collapse. That's just how it is. I wasn't asking to be handed anything. I was asking for an opportunity. An opportunity to say, let me just come and preach and pray and believe God because I can't build a church anyway. If it don't get built, you know, uh, I mean, if it gets built, it'll be because the Lord built it. In fact, the Bible said in the Old Testament, except the, the Lord uh, watch the house, the watchman rise in vain early. Amen? Unless the Lord is looking out. So, I'm saying this, that uh, don't be discouraged because someone else didn't make it. 
Don't be discouraged because someone else didn't take advantage of everything they could take advantage of. Don't be discouraged because someone else didn't have the faith to push through and hold on to their dream. Don't let that discourage you from doing what God called you to do. Amen? Because we know He told um, <clears throat> Jeremiah the prophet, Before I formed thee in thy mother's womb, I knew thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So don't say that I'm a child and... <clears throat> Don't say that I can't go, for you shall go, and you shall speak to all that I send thee. And as you say, all that I say, see, I have touched your lips, and I put my words in your mouth. So it is time now, I'm telling you, for us to be the church and not just come to church. So Jesus wasn't restricted to ministering just in the synagogues, but he, uh, he had a place in the hearts and lives of men and women of that day. After addressing the crowd that day, Jesus noticed that Simon and his companions along with him in the boat in the shoreline there, he asked uh, Peter a question, can I use your boat, I, I, you know, uh, he, he turns and asks him, uh, why don't you launch out into the deep, and uh, did he really mean out where the deep water is? I think, in my personal opinion, and this is my ecology, so you can take it or leave it. I think he's asking, you know, because he's already been speaking to the crowd. I believe he's saying something. You know, Jesus had this awful habit, it seemed, of saying deep things. Sometimes so deep that even his own disciples didn't understand it. And they, they're scratching their head, and when they get behind closed doors, they say, Lord, what is that you were saying out there? We didn't even understand you. And the Lord would have to tell them what he meant. And I, when he says, why don't you launch out, or he says, launch out into the deep, I really think he's speaking also about Simon Peter and his own ministry. And I'm not talking about, you see, because he told him, he, he really applied it when he got out there. He said, you know, get out into the deep. Go deeper than what you've been doing. Try something new. Go further. Go deeper. There's a great catch out there if you'll go get them. There's a great catch out there if you'll utilize what God's given you to utilize. There's, and I just think... I've got this sneaky suspicion that the Lord was prodding Simon Peter to use things that he hadn't used before, to go deeper than he had been before. And I'm not talking about the water or the depth of the water. Now, notice with me. I believe he was calling him to go into the deeper adventure of faith, to go into the deeper things of God. Now, Jesus challenges you. Launch out into the deep. There's more to life than fishing. I hadn't been in over a year. There's more to life than skydiving. I'm going Friday. Amen. There, there, there's more to life than the pleasures of this world. There's more to life than the pursuit of power. There's more to life than the achievement of fame and accumulation of wealth. There's more to life than going through a daily routine. There's more to life than eating and drinking and sleeping and waking and working and resting and making money and preparing for retirement. There's deep waters out there that God wants you to get involved in. You know what? I really think God is waiting to see how many of us will quit coming to church and just sitting there and hearing another great sermon or good sermon or even bad sermon or, or, or hearing another song and, and wonders when on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday or even Sunday we'll get our feet wet and get into something a little deeper than what we've been in. Getting quiet. Uh, it's getting quiet. And see, we want to talk about being the church but we'd rather just come to church. Huh? I'm telling you it's quiet. Lord have mercy, it's quiet. So I want you to notice with me the people that God uses. God uses ordinary people. Look at your neighbor and say, God uses ordinary people. I want to add a little addendum to that and say God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You can't do it in and of yourself. But if we'll humble, our, humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, oh, you know what? The way up is down. If we'll humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, He will exalt us in due season. Amen? It, but you know what? If I exalt myself, He will abase me. He'll humble me. Now, God uses ordinary people. Watch this. Here's fishermen. Here's common men, according to Acts 4 and 13. 
This was one of the distinctive features of Jesus as a rabbi. Traditionally, parents would save up their money to seek out a rabbi to teach their children the customs law. But this rabbi, Jesus, you remember when they found him in the, at, that day, or Rabboni, she says, Jesus went seeking. He was the rabbi that went seeking others, not waiting for them to come seek him. Huh? That's right. He, he went for the nine. Remember the one? He left the 99 and went for the one. Huh? You remember the woman at the well that he went to? You remember Zacchaeus who had climbed up into the sycamore tree? Huh? You remember the ones that... Uh, Jesus went to them, to blind Bartimaeus. He went to him. To Nathaniel standing beside the tree. Jesus went to them. He was the rabbi that didn't wait for you to come. There's churches right now that are closing the doors as I speak, still waiting for people to come. When they had people at one time that would not go out and get them. God is calling you, not just me. He's calling every one of us that name the name of Jesus to be the church, to be the hands of God, to be the feet of God, to be the voice of God. Now, um, God uses ordinary people. I mean, God used somebody like Moses who was tongue-tied. Huh? You say, well, I don't have good English. Well, Moses didn't have very good at all. And, and the Lord didn't accept that excuse, so he probably ain't going to accept yours either. He'd probably say, well, I, I really can't do much. I'm, you know, I'm kind of homebound. you got a computer. Huh. Oh, yeah. you got a telephone. There ain't no excuse. I, I mean, it just come too late to offer them. He said to Moses, well, your brother can speak real good. You can tell your brother what I want to say, and your brother can tell the people. So God has a way of nixing all the excuses you want to put in front of him. The bottom line is we offer excuses because we don't believe God will do something through us. Or, or we have a hard time thinking that God will accomplish his will through human beings. But I'm telling you, that's what he wants to do. So um, the tax collector and the prostitutes, uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees, these are going to enter the kingdom of heaven ahead of you, according to Matthew 21 and 31. Now, here's some, some three great lessons that we see in Luke 19 and 10. Jesus initiates the search. God is searching for us. For the Son of Man has come to seek. Say it with me. He has come to and to save that which was Lost. Buddy, that has been on my heart heavy for the last couple of weeks. I've told people, and I've told them in love, we are about, and I'm telling you, if you want a church that's going to sing Kumbaya and gather around a campfire and just enjoy the good old days, you've got the wrong one. Because God has called us to seek and to say, no, we can't save them, but we can bring them to one who can, those who are lost. I don't need to get saved. I am saved. So I ain't got to do it my way. And whatever I have to do to reach the person that is lost, that's what I'm willing to do. Amen. <laughs> well, hallelujah. So Jesus loves, just, he loves us just like we are. You know what? If someone's here tonight and they're in a, in, in a sin-ridden condition or a terrible relationship or, or, or just lost and undone without Him, Jesus loves you just like you are. But He loves you so much He don't want you to stay the way you are. He wants you to be delivered out of. You see, Jesus takes what we have and uses it for His glory. You know, you and I, there, there are people who say to me, well, when I finally, if I ever get right with God, I'm going to get in church. That's like saying, if I ever get clean, I'm going to get a shower. Huh? I don't want to mess up that new shower I just put in. If I ever get me a good bath, I'm going to get in there and get me a shower. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Right? Can I tell you, God uses fat people. Oh, I scared you. Hold on. I've got this acronym now. That means God uses faithful, available and teachable people. That's the people God uses. Faithful people. Available people. And teachable people. If you're not faithful, God can't use you. If you're not available, certainly God can't use you if you ain't available. And if you're not teachable, oh Lord, I'm going to say it again. Teachable, teachable, teachable. I got stuck. If we're not teachable and available and faithful, then so if we're not fat, God can't use us. You're going to go up and mess somebody up, I know. Somebody's going to leave out of here and say, well, Pastor, say, God don't use nobody but fat people. <laughs> what did Brother Glenn say? He was quoting the Bible and said, the fat is the Lord's, right? 
<laughs> Listen, um, God uses faithful people, available uh, people, and teachable people. So you, you get that in your head. And when, when that comes up, you tell them, well, you've got to be faithful. Huh? You've got to be available, and you've got to be teachable. So, so God uses ordinary people. Now look at your neighbor and say, God uses persevering people. In other words, God is going to use people that's not a quitter. Huh? God's, there's enough quitters out there, right? God don't want a quitter. The only time you're a failure is if you fall down and refuse to get up and try again. God uses uh, persevering people. Perseverance is a word that, that lets us know that we keep on pursuing. We keep on Pushing. That word push, someone said, pray until something happens. Keep on keeping on. So pursue. You see, it's the greatest resource that we have. Per per perseverance is a greater resource than ability. There are those who have less ability than someone over here. But they've got perseverance when this person don't. And they'll keep on pursuing and keep on pursuing and keep on pursuing. And while they had the ability but were lazy, God will take somebody who is uh, persistent, that will endure, that will persevere. God will say, you know what, I'll just teach you to do what they knew how to do and wouldn't do. Well, faith, you see, fishermen are, are patient men. They're a persevering, persevering breed. Now, if you're a fisherman, you understand that. I won't never forget um, back when I was doing a, a pretty good bit of pan fishing. Uh, you know, ultra. I love fishing in the Satilla River and the St. Mary's with the ultralight stuff, man. Man, you catch a fish as big as this bottle right here and think you had jaws on an ultralight reel. You know, that thing will bend way over. Oh, man, I'll be saying, get the net. You know, he ain't no bigger than my hand. <laughs> but, uh, you see, but I have found out, and you know, we've, we've had a great time fishing, but I have found out. That I don't care how good, your brother Eddie took me one day and, and showed me a place, boy, I said, ooh, this is sweet. Man, I come in there and I don't know if Eddie just anointed the place because everywhere he goes he catches fish or something. But I went in there, man, I caught him a time or two and then I went back, man, man, I don't know if the moon was messed up or I was messed up or somebody was messed up, but there wasn't a fish in the St. Mary's River hungry. Huh? I'm talking about none, narrowing, not a one. I come back after a while, man, sun burnt, you know, and, uh, you know, but the bottom line is I learned this. If you're going to fish, you've got to learn to be patient. I started reading articles on the Internet, think, I well, man, I learned how, you know, something about fishing. And they said a good fisherman knows where the fish are, no matter what the tide is. They know where the fish are, no matter what the moon phase is. I'm thinking, well, you're smart aleck, right? I, obviously, I wasn't a good fisherman. But they have learned that they have to be patient. And they have also learned that the same fishing hole that discouraged them this week might encourage them next week. So I have found that there's times I went and there wasn't a fish in the zip code. And then I come back and catch the wax out of them, if I can say it like Brother Wayne would have said it, right? Brother Wayne would say fish so thick you could walk on them, right? <laughs> God uses persevering people. So you, well, let me apply that spiritually. That means you've tried witnessing to your neighbor. You've tried fishing in that pond. Well, give it a little time and get your tackle and go back. Huh? That's right. Get, get with the Lord and go back and talk with them some more. Because God wants you to be the church and not just go to church. Now, um, God uses obedient people. Y'all with me? He uses ordinary people. He uses persevering people. And God uses obedient people. Now, now it's real tough to, to use somebody that won't obey you. Isn't that right? One of the greatest faith statements in the Bible is found in this beautiful passage. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. There are some folks that know better than the pastor what we ought to be doing. <clears throat> there are some that know better than the teacher what ought to be taught. There are some who know better than the overseer how to administrate. And you know what? They become thorns in overseer's flesh and thorns in pastor's flesh. You know what Paul said? You know what we need to do? He said, it needs to be that you make it a joy for me to be a bishop presiding over you. Are you all with me? That's right. And not to be a horror. You know... It's bad to say it. I guess it happens to every bishop. 
that you just hate to see some folk coming. Till I open my eyes yet, I guess. I'm just scanning like a radar. I know y'all thinking, is it me? Is it I? Who of us could do such a thing? <laughs> right? Right? Listen. You know, when we... We, gotta, we have to be obedient. You know something? I'm not asking someone to be obedient and follow me outside of God's Word. Paul said to the people, follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm out of the book, Brother Kenny, I hope you'll be the first to say, Pastor, with all due respect, I don't believe that's in the book quite the way you taught it or preached it. There's a time and a place to do that. And that's, that's welcomed. You know, if we're out of the book, we need to be challenged. But outside of that, we need to submit ourselves to the leadership God has given us and follow after them. And, and I'm going to tell you something. People will submit to your leadership in like passion, just like you have submitted to others over you and the Lord. So, you know, I've heard a state overseer say this one time. He says, pastors, you know what? You want people to come to your revivals when you have them, but you don't come to camp meeting when we have camp meeting. Huh? You want them to come to your meetings, but you don't come to the state meetings. That's a valid point. The people beneath you are going to give you the same kind of respect they see you giving those over you in the Lord. Wow. Didn't plan on all that, but there it is. If there's one word that you can put in your vocabulary, you need to put the word, nevertheless. Lord, we fished all night. Nevertheless. Pastor, we've tried that before. Nevertheless. Pastor, I don't like what you're doing. Nevertheless, Sunday school teacher, I don't like this. Yes, we will start some discipleship classes back when we have the room available and all that stuff when the church is being built or when it gets built. But I don't think this is the vision God... Well, God didn't make you the visionary of the church. Oh, Lord. Pastor, you done got mean and stupid tonight. huh? God uses obedient people. So we need to look at our neighbors and say, Learn this word with me, please. Nevertheless, huh? Nevertheless, I don't like this, but nevertheless, huh? I'm not in a hundred percent agreement with it, but it lines up with the Word of God. So, nevertheless, wow! I could preach a message entitled "Nevertheless." Wow! So, uh, in spite of discouragement, nevertheless. In, in spite of doubt and discontentment, in spite of what my neighbor and fellow church member called me and told me about, nevertheless, in spite of disillusionment and the failures of others and personal setbacks and personal failure, I will let down the net again. Wow. That's strong stuff, amen. Listen, I can't tell you the times that I've had to say, Lord... You know, because, man, I've resigned a whole lot on Sunday night after church. Huh? Man, I've had some days, boy, where I said, man, I'm going to tell you, first thing in the morning, I'm going to call the overseer, and I'm done. Monday morning come around, I said, well, I don't think I'll call him today. <laughs> I get to pray, and the Lord say, let down the net one more time. Y'all with me? And then by Wednesday, I'm ready to let down the net again. Oh, y'all, I know y'all are too spiritual. You've never had no days like that. Right? No, 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 no. No, no. God's people are stronger than that. God uses obedient people. Number four, you've got to get this. God uses humble people. God uses humble people. Man, there's nothing I can't stand any more than somebody that's puffed up and arrogant. It just, it, it, it grinds me the wrong way. And I just don't like it. I uh, I remember seeing a musician before, and I'll just be leave it nameless. This guy was good. Woo! He was good. He was so arrogant he couldn't walk through that door. I'm serious. And you know what? I heard an overseer say it best. God gets more glory out of an old cricket rubbing his back legs together, making them cricket sounds, than he does an arrogant musician. Amen? Or an arrogant anybody. An arrogant preacher that thinks, well, I, nobody can do it like me. Watch and see. Huh? An, an arrogant, 
uh, church planter, church builder, whoever it is. God don't like arrogance, period. So humility, listen, simply means to recognize that I need God. For me to be arrogant, that says I can do it on my own. For me to be boastful and proud, that means I don't really need God. I can make this happen. I'm going to tell you the, the stupidest, and if I can say it that way, the, the, the absolute craziest thing you will ever do in your life is to say I can do it on my own. You know why? God will show you. He will allow you to strike out and embark. He will allow you to fail. He will allow you to get in the mully grubs. He will allow you to look up to see bottom. If you don't believe it, check out Luke 15 and the prodigal son. If you don't believe it, check out Jonah when he ran from the Lord. If you don't believe it, check out the great prophet Elijah that was, you know, in the cave and, and finally heard that still small voice. Listen, God will let you try it your way. A mark of all, li listen, uh, you've got to look at Peter's honest heart, he says to the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came out there and he, he realized it was the Lord, he said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Right then he showed sheer humility. The master had asked to use his boat. He used his boat. He told him about his fishing trip all night and he caught nothing, all that stuff. But as soon as he realized it was the Lord, he said, depart from me, Lord. You and I don't even need to be in the same room together, on the same boat, because I'm sinful. And what he's saying is, you're holy, and I'm not. Y'all with me? Hang on now, it's going to get better. A mark of all of God's servants. A hallmark of all of God's servants is this, humility. Abraham said, I am nothing but dust and ashes. Jacob said, I am less than the least of all of your mercies. Job said, I repent and abhor myself. Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am undone. And Paul said, I'm the chief among sinners and the least of the apostles. John Bradford, the faithful martyr for Christ, he used to sign some of his letters with these words, a most miserable sinner, John Bradford. Humility will take you further up the mountain than pride will ever take you. If you're proud and boastful and arrogant, you won't go far. You'll find out that your abilities amount to nothing outside of the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, so God uses, uh, what did we say, ordinary people. God uses persevering people. God uses obedient people. God uses humble people and God uses visionary people. Now, <clears throat> listen. Um, in the church, obviously it becomes my role as a pastor to cast the vision for the people. It becomes your duty to examine that vision, look at it, see if it lines up with what the Word of God says. If it does line up with what the Word of God says, you need to get behind that vision and support it 110%. But let me go ahead further. Physically, spiritually, financially, socially. That means you need to be here when the doors are open. That means you need to tell people about the vision. That means you need to give to the vision. That means all of the above. Y'all with me? Say amen. Lord, have mercy. I didn't mean to get so strung out. But God uses visionary people, and God wants you to buy in to the vision. Listen, vision inspires loyalty. Right now, <clears throat> Some of y'all are saying, man, it's been a long time coming, but we are going to build a harbor one day. We're going to have a place to train people. And boy, I'm going to tell you, it is, you'll find out in October. <laughs> but it is about training people in the kingdom of God because we're about lost people. Are y'all with me? So we're going to train some disciples. Y'all hearing me? Yep. Um, so don't, listen, he says, uh, Christ gives Peter this vision of what he can be and what he can do for the kingdom of God. Don't be afraid, he says, because you're not going to keep catching fish. You're going to start catching men. I believe what he's saying is this, is that I, I, I saw that you were willing to give me what you had, which was your boat. I saw, I saw that you were willing to give me what you had, which was your hands and your heart. You worked all night and you was tired and willing to, you then folded up the nets and mended them. You, he said, but I saw that you gave me all of that. And then still you were obedient and, and, and you went back fishing. You got out in the deep. 
You obeyed me and look what you've caught. Now I'm telling you this. I see more than you, Simon Peter. You're going to do greater things than this because I'm going to use what you don't even know you have. You're a leader. You don't even know it. Huh? Wow. <laughs> You're a leader and you don't even know it. He says, you know, you remember there was a time when they asked, he, he asked Simon Peter, he said, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? He said, well, some say Elias, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said, but Simon Peter, who do you say I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And now I'm going to give to you the keys to the kingdom of, huh? Keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. Wow, right? He told him in another time that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you the keys and uh, you know, I'm going to give you power and unction and anointing and nothing shall by any means hurt you. God uses visionary people. Uh, these men traveled with Jesus on their uh, ministry tours and returned home to raise their families uh, that they had and they followed Jesus closely. Now, I want to read um, an illustration to you. It comes from Norman Vincent Peale. He told a story of a friend who, and, and this is one of... Um, comes from one of the great books that um, our overseer, Brother Ray Garner, invited me to read. Norman Vince Appeal told a story of a friend who grew up very poor in a Midwestern city. His father told him he could, go, uh, he could only go to school through the lower grades, and then he'd have to give up school and come to work to support the family. One day he's walking down the street of a, a, a main business, uh, uh, walking down one of the main business streets of the city that he lived in, he passed a newspaper office and he saw a man sitting behind a desk there. His coat was off, his vest was unbuttoned, his tie was loose, his sleeves was rolled up. The young boy was struck immediately and it just transfixed him for a moment. And he asked the policeman at the corner, he said, who is that man? That man, the replied the officer, is the editor of the newspaper. And he is about the most powerful influence in this whole area. How did he get that job? Asked the boy. He said, I don't know. Uh, he probably worked for it, the officer answered, I mean, the officer answered, he probably worked for it. And uh, right then and there, the boy envisioned himself as the editor of that newspaper. The image was formed in his mind. He had no doubt about it at all. That would be his future. So he went to work. At first, he got a job delivering newspapers. Then he got on one of the trucks that took the papers out. Next, he moved into advertising uh, department and advanced rather rapidly. But this wasn't the normal path that led to being in the editorial chair. The day then came when the editor's position was open. The publisher called him and said, Roger, I don't know why I'm going to make you this offer. You're the best advertising man we've ever had, but I have an overwhelming feeling that you are intended to be the editor of this newspaper. So I appoint you editor-in-chief. Thank you, sir, Roger said, but God gave me this job years ago. The publisher listened in astonishment to Roger's story. He had had a dream of what he could be, and it came to pass. Don't ever give up on what God has put in your head and he's put in your heart. Would you stand with me tonight? Don't ever give up on being a visionary. On This young boy looked and said, I'm going to be an editor one day. Yeah, how many of you know that when it's a vision from God, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. <clears throat> that day on the shore of Galilee, Peter caught a glimpse of the man that he could be in Jesus Christ. And it came to pass. If you remember, um, the Lord showed him some great things. If you remember, he became the premier preacher of, uh, of the New Testament church. In fact, all of uh, Catholicism looks to him now, you know, as the first pope, if you will, in, as far as they're concerned. But he was the, the, the preacher that delivered the powerful message referencing Joel chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 at Pentecost. The crux of the matter is this. They left everything and followed the Lord. I will say this. I wish the room was filled with young, aspiring ministers. I will never forget my departure from the United States Air Force for absolutely a promise of nothing, really. Um, believing God that somehow 
you've called, somehow you're going to make a way. And I won't ever forget, I was already on terminal leave. That means the last leave you're going to take. And the pastor asked me about becoming the associate pastor. The problem was this. They had the position and we could put you as an associate pastor. We just ain't got the money to pay you. The problem with that was that I had two children. I said, well, pastor, you know what? I'll work like a dog and I'll go get another job. I'm tickled to, become, to, to, to come aboard. They said, we can pledge $984 a month. And I want you to see this wisdom of this great young prophet of the Lord. <laughs> and I'm being facetious. I said, you know, if the church could somehow make that 1200 I wouldn't even go get a second job. Are you with me? They said, we'll make it 1200 I didn't even go get a second job. You know what I did? I dug my heels in, and I believed that God was going to make a way. And Brother Kenny, I can't tell you the times. It blows my mind. I've never seen nothing like it since, ever. And I've been in ministry 26 years. I can't tell you the times. Every single month, some member of that church or some outsider, either I went and preached somewhere and God gave us some inflow. I had people hand me three $100 bills at a time, several times in church. Sometimes it was two. Sometimes it was one. Sometimes it was a 50. I, I just can't tell you the times. God took care of me again and again and again and again. Because we're willing to leave all. I know people say, well, Pastor, that's just reckless abandon and that's stupidity. It's not looking after your family. Listen, if God has called and God is in it, I, I believe, yes. And you know what? When I came here, I said, hey, I, and when I went to Claxton, I said, hey, I'll go to work. I work three jobs. I was a bailiff in Superior Court. I was a juvenile intake officer for the state two weekends out of the month. I directed traffic. I pastored the church. Are y'all hearing me? I've done what I had to do. Here, I drove a school bus for 13 years. I do what I have to do. And you know what? If it required it again, I'm not above it. I'm simply saying this. God will lead you great places if you're willing to let go and let God. If you're willing to be faithful and say, Lord. See, because God uses ordinary people. God uses uh, humble people. God uses obedient people. God uses persevering people. God uses visionary people. And that's the kind of people we are. God wants you to be the church and not just come to church. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord. It's been awesome. I have felt the great presence of your Spirit. I pray, Lord, that tonight that people are raised up and say, no longer will I just come to church. I will be the church in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you is my prayer. Keep up with us at the Harbor Worship Center dot org. God bless you. Please remember Friday. The youth revival starts 6.30 is the pre-service.